Welcome again to the International Church of St. Paul. I had to think about where I was at, but that's it. What do you do when circumstances aren't what you expected, when they're tough or when they're great? What do you do when um, the results are not necessarily what you would want of them? How do you handle the difficult moments when others get rewarded, when you're overlooked, when you're forgotten? What is it that drives you to continue to walk, to continue to be obedient, to continue to draw close, to continue to be the man or the woman of God that you are called to be? We need to trust Him in His calling. His timing is every detail. We do not flee His word nor His will, but we run to it. Living out our faith is following Him, His Word, no matter what. When this year started, I, I knew we had a couple of kids graduating. We were looking forward to that. Um, I knew I was going to have to travel once or twice, uh, more than I thought is normal. Uh, I've been living, just to tell you, just to be very clear and uh, transparent with you, I have been living for November 5th. Not because the American election, I didn't even know it lined up with that. But I knew that I would be back here on Tuesday, November 5th, with no travel in my foreseeable future. Um, with my wife returning from Madrid tomorrow, with this pastor's conference we were at last week, which was great. But again, it's, it's us serving and giving out. I didn't know that Jen's dad was going to die this year. I didn't know that Eric was going to be in the ICU and it's going to be tenuous for the next probably couple years on his health. Uh, I, I didn't know that there was a mother-in-law that was going to need some special attention, a child that was going to have to get some tender care. Uh, I was coming back here. So I'm going to preach to me. And you get to listen, all right? And honestly, I, I, this morning, Jim Beerley, the pastor of Monaco Christian Fellowship for 17 years, about a decade ago, was going to be here. At 10.05, as I re-entered into what I thought was going to be a pretty easy week, being bombarded with a few emails and other things that have changed that look, I find out at 10.05, Jim can't come. So here we are. We're going to go to Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 11.22. This was actually taught to me in a man's living room at 5.30 in the morning when I was probably about 25 years old. And this uh, character sketch, is what we're going to call it, has stuck with me forever. Forever. Who is Beniah? Some of you may know. Some of you may only have come across him in your reading through the Bible and just kept on going. I love biographies. I love learning from others. The context and the chronology, since we're not going through like we normally do, go through a book and you know the context as we go, uh, this is the chronology of the, the kingdom. Saul has fallen, okay? He was brought forth to be king and he has fallen. David is ascending to the throne after 14 years of running around, hiding in caves, ducking spears told and anointed as king, but then having to wait on that calling to meet timing 14 years later, that alone is a, is a character sketch study, okay? Two chances to take out his rival, did not, chose to walk in the will of the Lord, had to be in uh, cahoots with his enemy, had to act crazy, but now the time has come. David is ascending. David has surrounded himself by a group of mighty, mighty, mighty men. And in Chronicles, it's talking about those mighty. It talks about the three and the thirty. And then there's guys like we're going to study today, Beniah. All right? Lesser known men. But the chapter following talks about God's glory being made known. So in the context of this character sketch, you've got these unknown men, these 30 kind of known men, these three really known men, and David. And what is common between top to bottom is that they are God's men called to walk 
in His will. Called to living out God's kingdom. Let's read the text. I'm going to break the order a little bit. Um, We'll read it in order, but I'm going to teach it just a little bit switched. You'll see. Verse 22, 1 Chronicles 11. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. First thing, before we get into this text, is these two names are never, hardly ever, apart. And, and when, when the Bible does things like that that are conspicuous, you want to know why. And um, Jehoiada uh, means uh, God knows. So his dad's name means God knows. Benaiah means God builds or God builds up. So as we go through this, God knows and God builds up. Your circumstances, the results, you being forgotten, your downfall, your highlights, God knows. And God's building. Maybe not the way you want. I, I, I think life would be a lot easier and simpler if certain things would happen. But they don't. God knows. And God builds me just like he builds you. The, the issue, and the, this gives away the whole sermon basically, but the issue is how do you respond? Because do you take those circumstances and say, hey, I don't like them, I'm going to run over here and change it my own way. Or hey, I don't like these results, I don't like being forgotten, so I'm going to broadcast my name and basically rob God's glory on how he's doing things. Try to change my stars by my own handling. Try to make me known instead of making him know. When we sing, he is our breath, we mean he is our life. When we say he is our life, we mean this is not mine. When we mean this is not mine, we mean we as Christians live for him. Nothing else. And when I am living for me or something else to please my wife, please my kids, to please you or the leadership team, that is called sin. Okay? Sin. We have an audience of one. All right, you get an extra sermon there. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. So this guy, he had some crazy gifts. Watch. He struck down two heroes of Moab. Actually, the word there is Ariel. It's a word in the Bible that no one, no one knows what means. So they guess. Two something of Moab. This translation says heroes. I think the King James, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it says two troops or two regents of men. So he took on two tribes. Whatever it is, it's something great. We'll get to that. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when snow had fallen. And he struck down an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits tall. The Egyptian had in his hand a spear like a weaver's beam, which means nothing to you. A weaver's beam was about four inches in diameter. All right, so this is something someone who's big enough can chunk at enemy 30 meters away and hit them. Some of us would be fortunate if we could even curl it, okay? And this guy is tossing it around like we toss frisbees or petanque balls, however you want. So the Egyptian had in his hand a spear like a weaver's beam, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff, so basically a stick for shepherding sheep. Went down to him with a staff, snatched that big old spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the one he builds, the one who knows, and one a name beside the three mighty men. That's it. So Badiah is from nowhere. Kabzeel. Anyone? If I put a map up, can you tell me where Kabzeel is? It's nowhere. All right. 
much like Jesus. Nazareth, you ever been to Nazareth? There's nothing spectacular about Nazareth. If you're from there, I apologize. I was there a couple of years ago. Pretty normative city. All right? Not too many people. Remember, they would say about Jesus, how can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was from nowhere special. Many times we think that where we start determines where we will end. Sometimes. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you start where there's no water, no food. Sometimes you start in, you know, a silver spoon in your mouth. Those are very different places. Does it matter? It can. Does it have to? It doesn't. Who's in charge? God knows. And God builds. Where you come from may matter. It may not. It may play largely in what you become, positively or negative. I had a few years on a little island in the middle of the Pacific called Midway Island. 500 people. One mile long, less than a mile wide. So less than two kilometers in any direction. No cars, because the island would sink. And I learned how to be independent, because you could. Kids were free to run around the island because there was nothing that could harm them. Nobody could harm them and escape. It was just an open community. And that independence built a lot into me in those young years. Good and bad. So where you're from can impact you. Where you live may matter, it may not. More importantly is that God, God knows where you are. The God who knows, the God who builds. Before David became a king, Benaiah was being faithful, making a name uh, through numerous daring military achievements. You can go down and, and see. He's, he's about a dozen times noted in the Bible. But these things don't make him one of the three. They don't make him David. He doesn't get looked at. His timing uh, isn't the same. For example, he strikes down a huge Egyptian. That Egyptian was as big, if not bigger, than Goliath. Okay? For David, that got him betrothed to the king's daughter. For Benaiah, it gets an honorable mention in the Bible. Do you find yourself being faithful and not being recognized like others? Does that change your motivation of faithfulness? If it does, then it's likely you're living this way. Not to the God who knows and the God who builds, okay? That we need to call in to check why it is we do the things we do. David does the same thing, but it happened at a critical moment in Israel's history. It set him up for the kingdom. It made him actually to become the king by killing someone just like Benaiah did. Benaiah gets a couple lines. David becomes the kingdom of David, the city of David, the star of David, the the lineage of Jesus. How does it impact you when you're doing the same faithful things but not getting the recognition of others? Benaya, you probably haven't even heard of him except for when you're reading through your Bible. Bad timing? Or God knows, and God builds. He also struck down two mightiest warriors. We'll, we'll go with the text. It could mean two regents of men. There's a place, one of the guys, a little bit earlier in Chronicles, takes on two troops as well. Uh, didn't use the same word, so it's hard to say. We don't know what Ariel is, but we know that it's two intimidating somethings. He struck down a huge Egyptian. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand. Benaiah shows up with a staff. 
He goes forward to this massive, probably eight foot being, and with his staff somehow dislodges the spear, and without being grappled by this huge giant, takes the spear, pulls back, and kills the giant with his own weapon. Made him famous as the three other warriors, but he didn't get, they didn't make it into four mighty warriors. It's just three. Wrong place, wrong time. God knows. God builds. God's plan is going forth no matter what happens Tuesday in the American election. Honestly, at the beginning of the election and I saw the candidates, I prayed for both of them to go home. That, that was my vote. Go home. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah. But here you are. The timing isn't like it was for David. It isn't like it was for Paul on a road to Damascus and his salvation changes everything and he writes most of the New Testament. The circumstances, the results are different. But do we trust that God, you are the air I breathe. God, you are the life I live. God, this is for you, not for me. I'm not trying to rob your glory. I'm trying to give you glory. God knows. God builds. This third one, which is not the third one, it's the second one in the series, and this is where I'm going out of thing. This is the one that makes the story stick to me. He also went down into a pit. Okay? Uh, I remember in Texas, I worked at a sports camp for a couple of summers. We have, in Texas, the ground is fairly hollow. That's why it shifts all the time. And uh, there's a lot of aquifers down there. But some of those aquifers dry up, and so you have these massive caverns, like miles and miles and miles of underground caverns that you can go explore. See the stalactites and stalagmites. I don't know which way is which, but whatever. And, and you can get under there. I'm okay with the dark. I'm even okay with being underground. But when I'm crawling on my belly underground through a cave that just barely fits me for the amusement of a bunch of kids who are there for sports camp, and I know that Texas has four snakes that will kill you dead if they bite you, I'm a little less okay. Just honest. All right? So pets, maybe... But he goes into a pit, not only that is a pit, but there's a lion in there. Why? The, the text doesn't say. There's a pit with a lion. I'm thinking, yeah, no, in Texas we get a gun and we handle that. Um, maybe it was endangerment to his community, his family. I don't know. But for whatever reason, Benaiah thought, I need to settle this. I need to take care of this problem. And not only was it a pit and a lion, and Jim reminded me that lions have four-wheel drive. If you've, if you've ever seen them go up trees or scale mountains or whatever, they're crazy good at movement. So upper hand goes to the lion. But then... Because it's not hard enough, let's throw a little slippery ice on top of that. And so Benaiah sees a pit with snow all over it, with a lion in it, and goes down to take care of business. And he does. And we look at these feats, and we look at these guys and we see that if you read Chronicles, all these men were not afraid of the circumstances. They did not run 
away from their duty. They did not consider themselves more important than another. We're military, fighting for a cause. Yes, sir. And sometimes I think we forget that we are in an army. It's God's army. That we are to be fighting for a cause. It's His cause. And that our lives are paid for to willfully and wonderfully walk by faith. By faith. Now, I don't know your circumstances. You guys get to know mine because I get to spout them up here. But you probably have a lion that God has placed in your life. It, it, it hasn't happenstance. It's not chance. It's not just random. And it may be in a pit that you're going to have to clear out. And that pit may be also full of snow. What are you going to do? We are called to walk in God's kingdom. We are called to express our faith by trusting in the circumstances that he gives us to go forward in. We are to be faithful, not uh, to come up with creative solutions necessarily, but to come up with biblical, God-honoring, glorifying solutions. Let's go forward a few hundred years from this text. There was a man who came to a pit. That pit we live in is called our world. That pit has all kinds of slippery surfaces. If you don't believe it, have you watched the news in Valencia this weekend? Or Jazzy shared a uh, happening in Nova Sad this past week? Or get on the major news of Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, Palestine, Israel, Iran. We, we like this place, but in comparison to where we're going, this is a pit. Jesus came from where we're headed, and he saw a lion. First Peter says, a roaring lion that looks and waits and wanders, hoping to devour you. And Jesus came to a pit on a snowy day and slew a lion. And his name was Satan. He killed him by dying himself. That Jesus came and lived as a man, just like you and I, and instead of us stealing glory, he gave all glory to God. I came to do what my Father has asked. I have done everything that he asked me to do. He said on the cross to Telestai, it's a business term that says, paid in full. I have done this. And in so doing, he paid the price for all of yours and my sin so that the God who we sing holy, 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 who no sin can come into his presence, who could never have fellowship with us unless we have been made clean, that God who we offended, by the way, by not going into the pit, by denying what we believe, that holy creator God he said, I'm not going to stomp them out. I'm going to send my son to pay their price for them. And he did. And that's why Jesus was crucified. He paid the price for your sin. He came to the pit, took on the lion on a snowy day, and slew him. And then after that, to prove that death is not our end, he rose from the grave on the third day, just as he had predicted. 
and eventually rose to the right hand of God where he sits today and intercedes, prays for you. That we might now be him here. And that's Christianity. It's not 90 minutes on a Sunday. It's not even another 90-minute installation on Wednesday night at home group. Those things are to help. But it's 24-7. It's all on. It's in those secret places that you think no one's going to notice. It's in the public places where you can choose to make him known or you know. You are not your own. You have been bought by the Lord who came to a pit on a snowy day and slew the lion. Some applications. God knows where you are. The world, your circumstances, everything is crying against that belief. Trying to break down that there truly is a real God that knows where you're at. Paul tells us, do not be surprised when suffering comes. When trials of many kinds find us. When circumstances don't go the way we want it. I didn't want to have to leave my country. I didn't want to lose my job. I didn't want my child to lose their life. I'd hope this marriage didn't end in divorce. But it did. Now what? God knows. Okay, Lord, I get it. You know. Build me. May we be like the guy who cries out to Jesus... Help me with my faith. It is weak. God knows. And God appointed your time specific for you. David gets the kingdom. Benaiah gets a few lines in the Bible. Others aren't even named. But he called you from the beginning of time for this time. He appointed you and me to this place, to these people, wherever we are. We need to believe that God knows. He has appointed. Further, God has gifted you just like he gifted Benaiah. Not not the exact same gifts, but he's given you gifts. If If you study Ephesians, Philippians, other parts of the Bible, you will see that those were gifts were intended first and foremost to be used right here in your body of Christ. So if you're not using your gifts here in this church or in the church that you belong to, you're frustrated with your faith because you're not doing what you were created to do. Get in gear. But I don't know. Great, that's why we have home groups. But what can I do? Great, that's why we have leadership team. Come talk to us. We'll place you. There's things to do. God has gifted you specifically. And I don't care if you're 15 or 85. God has gifted you to do something here. It's for His glory that we live.
even during the tough task. Last week, I got word, last Sunday, of an Angola missionary who, who died. Five kids. Wife. He can pull Psalm 73 out like Asaph and go, why, why am I doing these things if this, or his wife could, he can't, but his wife could say, why was he doing these things if this is what we're going to get paid? And in that statement, what I'm saying, not that it's not part of the grieving and necessary steps I need to go through, but in that statement I'm saying, God, your ways don't match up with right ways. And that's when we realize that we have misinformation on who God is and what God does. Who's going to remember you in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? Will you be more than a few lines on the Bible? That very few, I would guess, read through Chronicles recently. But we're not living horizontally. We're living vertically. We live for an audience of one, and his name is God. His name is Jesus. We serve God, not man. We do what he asks when he asks. We are not here to please or glorify man, but God. I am not here to glorify myself, my image, but God's. So you got all these men dedicated all to this cause who have different tasks walking forward faithfully which is how the church is supposed to function. Maybe you don't have a pit in front of you today. Praise God. But there's one coming. It, it's guaranteed. How are you going to walk? Will your circumstances change your faith? Are you living for results of your faith or for the glory of the one who has given it to you? We need a little Benaiah. We need to walk faithfully in the circumstances that he knows and he has called us to.